At the dawn of history, man made fire and started keeping records, painting pictures on the walls of his cave. As at Lascaux, southwest France, where these paintings were made 30,000 years ago. And he also started counting things, as with these tally marks discovered in the Lascaux caves. In time, the pictures became writing, which was carved into stone, painted onto papyrus reeds rolled flat, put onto parchment, and written on paper. And all the while, man was still counting things, keeping accounts. Now, with medieval tally sticks, notched in pounds, shillings, and pence, and split over a deal into stock and foil. Hence the counterfoil in your checkbook today. Old accounts, in fact, now provide valuable material for historical research. The pipe roll recorded revenue collected for the crown by sheriffs from all over the country. These old parchments were known as rolls, and the head of the public record office is today called Master of the Rolls. A count book of the Frescobaldi, Merchants of Florence, 1311. The beginning of double entry bookkeeping. Debit and credit entries cancelled when they balanced. The housekeeping accounts of the Lady of Clare, Suffolk, decorated in the spirit of Christmas, December 1357. She founded Clare College at the University of Cambridge. More household accounts of Henry VII. Each item is initialed by the king himself. Sometimes illuminations make these old records into works of art. This is an initial letter C of the Latin word compotus from the accounts of the monastery of St. Albans. And here, a pile of privy seal warrants for issue, 1597. The leather thong preceded the modern spike. A brewer's accounts, Roman numerals still in use, but now mixed with Arabic. The introduction of the Arabic figure naught stimulated mathematics after the Renaissance. True double entry, 1619, with cross-reference between journal, ledger, and cash book. But there were doubtful debts to record. 1644 personal accounts, given to my sister to buy a joint of meat for my mother, three shillings. For Mr. Ringman for stopping my tooth, two shillings and sixpence. The Royal Africa Company dealt in silks, spices, elephant's teeth, and the appalling trade in slaves. A waste book entry for June the 6th, 1682, which can also be found in the journal. For 229 Negroes, shipped in said Edgar, valued at five pounds per head, being extraordinarily scarce, and for the corn. Five times 229, 1,145 pounds. Cross-reference numbers help us to find the ledger entries. Two ditto for 229 Negroes. Waste book of a London bathhouse, 1725. Mr. Salter, a bath, ten and sixpence. The Duchess of Wharton, blooded, one guinea. The style of leather binding of account books was standardized early on. Even today, it's sometimes reproduced by printing on the covers of inexpensive rent books. Still using fire, man made machines and steel with which to make more machines, ever increasing the output and efficiency of those engaged in industry. 
so that records of purchase and sale, records of profit and loss, the counting of things and money, became more important than ever before and more complex. There had never been so many books to keep, so much figure work to be done. The simple counting in the cave had become in time the intricate art of accountancy. And behind every industrial concern of the prosperous 19th century, there was the bookkeeper, the clerk, the accountant. A worker in shirt sleeves, a worker of precision, a worker on whose accuracy so much depended. And above all, a man of integrity. Parliamentary legislation in the form of the Companies Act of 1862 had been devised to protect the interests of the creditors and shareholders of business and industry. Before the end of the Victorian era, the accountant had been elevated to an important professional status. Balance sheet as at 31st December 1898. Today, it seems very much as if the machines do most of the work. And men mind the machines. Other men put the parts together in the assembly shop. Altogether, it takes 2,518 parts to make one of these tractors. And here, they are turning out 300 tractors a day. Production on this scale now makes record keeping one of the major problems of management. Modern accountancy now demands the day-to-day -day analysis of vast numbers of facts and figures, so that detailed and accurate information can be made available with speed and regularity. The accountant, in fact, has had to keep pace with the time. but not like this. All this. Whoops, no future in that. Fortunately, there is a better way. can now be handled by machines. Today, accountancy is mechanized. The accountant's demand for efficiency has been answered. By a simple process of punching holes in cards, the figures can actually be put to work for themselves. Like the tally marks in the cave 30,000 years ago, the holes all look the same, but the position of each hole in the card now gives it a numerical significance. First then, let us look at this mechanized record, the punched card. This card is designed to handle that stock control problem in the factory. Basically, it's divided into 80 vertical columns. Each column has punching positions for digits. Not to nine, with two extra, called X and Y, to make 12 column positions in all. The columns are divided into sections called fields for dealing with different items, 
and the number of columns in each field is determined by the maximum number of digits to be recorded in it. The date, for example, 25450, requires here a six column field. It would be punched 25, not 4, 5 naught. Thus the 2 is punched, and then the 5. Then not four, five, not. In the same way on this card, the part number and the quantity. There's also a field for description. By punching two holes in the same column working from a code, alphabetical information is recorded in the card. L O C K I N G. P-L-A-T-E, locking plate. And here's the rest of the card being punched at the actual speed of an average operator on this job. On the basic design of 80 columns and 12 punching positions in each column, a card can be planned for every job. Invoices, payrolls, the analysis of sales and purchases. Cards can be planned for every function in modern accountancy. There are also 38 column cards for handling a smaller volume of information in each card. The corner cut shows at once when a card is stacked the wrong way around in the pack. Vital therefore to the whole process is the initial preparation of this highly mobile record into which information must be punched from the original documents. In this case, one card for each type of stock movement in the factory. This little machine is the simplest form of key punch, on which a series of keys correspond to the 12 punching positions on the card. And in slow motion. The depression of the key causes the appropriate hole to be punched, and a spring escapement moves the carriage with the card to the next column position. These punches are normally operated by junior staff and in reality very high speeds are quickly attainable with great accuracy. The card change in slow motion has an interesting rhythm. And what of the double entry bookkeeping established since the Middle Ages? Here it's no longer a problem, for the holes punched in any single card now provide the figures for posting all books of account on either the debit or credit side. They must agree, since their origin is common. A single pack of cards now contains all the information previously recorded in a variety of different and unwieldy books. But the punching must be correct. No, this is not another punching operation, but verification of the cards already punched. By means of this electrically assisted verifier, a second operator is repeating the punching process as a check on the accuracy of the perforations in each card. At each key depression, 12 plungers seek out the hole in each column, electrically verifying the correctness of the punching. On finding an error, the machine stops, and the card is no longer fed forward. A column indicator shows where the error has occurred, and the mistake is marked. After verification of punching, the human element virtually disappears. Thereafter, the figures themselves, now holes in the cards, simply operate the machines. First, the cards are sorted into strict numerical order according to the job in hand. This sorting machine works at a speed of 40,000 cards an hour and is here arranging the new batch of stock control cards in numerical sequence according to part numbers. Hence, all cards with the same part number will find themselves grouped together when sorting is complete. How does it work? The punched cards are loaded into this feed hopper with the lower edge towards the machine, with the nine edge leading, as it's called. The first card, fed from the bottom, passes over a contact roller. An electrical brush is set to sense, as they say, to sense the column on which the cards are being sorted.
when an electrical contact is made. Meanwhile, the leading edge of the card has passed between a series of shoot blades and a contact plate. Beneath the contact plate is an electromagnet. When the brush sensed a hole at four in the card, a circuit was completed and the electromagnet energized. Pulling down the contact plate and letting fall all the shoot blades not supported by the card. As the card is rolled forward, it's fed under shoot blade four and so automatically carried on its way. To be delivered in the end to pocket four. senses the holes in one column at a time. First units, then tens, hundreds, thousands and so on. The brush must be reset to sort on the next column between each passage of the pack through the machine. A four-figure number would mean passing the card four times through the sorter. Cards passing beneath the brush in slow motion. And so to the tabulator, the assembly shot of the installation. Here, the finished product is rolled off the assembly line. The invoice, the payroll, the statement. Daily, weekly, monthly. Here, the facts and figures are put together by machinery, just as we want them. A tabulator such as this consists of four basic units, the card feed, the control panels, the counters, and the print unit. It can carry out the operations of modern accountancy from the simplest to the most complex. At a rate of 175 cards a minute, it can, for example, add up the figures punched into the cards from one field or a number of fields and will arrive at a simple total. How does this work? Remembering the sorter, the cards on the tabulator are sensed in the same way. But instead of one brush, there are 80 brushes sensing 80 columns simultaneously. The information is then taken by way of control panel number one to the counters. In this case, counter five. When, for example, one brush senses a hole punched at eight, an electrical impulse reaches a counter wheel which starts to turn until eight units have been added. To repeat, the counter wheel starts to turn once the hole is sensed and continues turning throughout the time it takes for the brush to reach the top of the column, thus adding eight units. In this case, the counter is adding from a seven column field, 28 to 34. The next card is punched 14, and as the holes at four and one are sensed, the units and tens wheels revolve so that eight becomes 22. and so on to the last card giving the total. The counter is cleared and the answer is printed. The control panels are in effect the central telephone exchange of the machine in which flexibility of operation is essential. To change from one job to another it's an easy matter for the operator to re-plug the panels and completely alter the function of the tabulator. Broadly speaking, number one panel deals with the question, 
Where? Where the information is to be taken from the card columns. To one or more counters. To the counters and print unit. Or to the print unit only. Number three deals with the questions what and when. What figure should be added, when printed, what totals rolled from one counter to another and when. Number two completes the pathways along which such information will go. By plugging panel one from card columns direct to print unit, the tabulator is made to list the information direct from the cards. Here it is, listing. Now, when a four is sensed from the card, instead of rotating a counter wheel four units, it causes a print bar to rise until a four is automatically printed on the paper. To repeat, the rising print bar is arrested when the four is sensed, and a tiny hammer operated when the brush reaches the top of the column. Meanwhile, the sorting of the stock control cards is being completed. tabulator finishes a payroll statement. A steady flow of work for the machines is one of the secrets of efficiency in mechanized accountancy. Next, that stock control job, a continuous check on the stock position in the factory. The supervisor gives the operator the cards, punched, verified, sorted, and now ready for assembly into a statement. Everything is organized to start each job at a moment's notice. On frequently recurring jobs, fixed panels permanently plugged are available for slipping into the machine when required. Part of the service which goes with the machines is to assist in the planning of the work and to prepare charts. Working from a chart, the operator adjusts the switches. and sets up the machine ready for the new job. The tabulator is now ready to produce a comprehensive statement of the current stock position in the factory. For each item on the stock list, the tabulator will print the quantity issued and the quantity received and will strike the balance between them. It will give the quantity allocated, the quantity on order, the forward stock position and the balance against the minimum stock permitted in the factory. By sorting on part numbers, the cards have been arranged in groups. First, locking plates again. And from the first card, the machine prints the description and records the previous balances, taking the balance of allocations to count to three, the order balance to count to four, the minimum stock to the storage unit. It prints the date, the unit of quantity, and stores the quantity of stock balance in counter two. The second card deals with issues against allocations. It prints the date, the document reference number, and the part number, 
and adds the issues into counters one and six. The third is an allocations card, adding the quantity to the figure standing in counter three from the first card. The fourth card of this group receipts against orders, and so on throughout all transactions dealing with locking plates, orders, issues, receipts. For every stock movement in the factory, a card would have been punched. And here it is on the machine. Balance of allocations to counter three, 98 locking plates. Balance of orders to counter four, 26. Balance of stock to counter two, one, two, seven. And here's the storage unit holding minimum stock. While description, date and stock balance from counter two are printed at the same time. And so the second card reaches the brushes, adding the issuers against allocations in counter one. And counter six. And so on for the remaining cards of the group dealing with locking plates. Then, quite automatically, the tabulator pauses. The card feed stops. While the machine calculates the totals, strikes the balances, and prints a complete report on the current stock position for locking plates. But what brings about this pause for such rapid arithmetic? There are, in fact, two sets of brushes, one above those already shown. Both sense the card field controlling the machine. Here are the part number. But when the first card of a new part number arrives, Two, 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 eight. Here it is. The numbers of the upper and lower brushes are different, and the card feed stops while the machine cycles, as they say, to carry out the calculations. Counter one has added all the locking plates issued, 89, which is printed. Counter two has totaled the receipts, 225. This is printed also. In counter six are the issues against allocations, while counter three contains the allocations. Subtraction gives the balance. Two, seven, five. But how? How does the machine subtract? For simplicity in operation and manufacture, the wheels do not go backwards. The machine subtracts by adding, by adding the nines complement of 83, which is all those nines, or the maximum the counter can hold, less 83, or this figure, the complement of 83, which is now rolled and added in the other counter. But there's a snag, for six and eight are 14. No difficulty there, just four and one to carry. Then one and five are six. And one makes seven. Now nine and three are 12, which is two and one to carry. So that nine and one are 10, giving naught and one to carry. Making nine and one are 10 again, or naught and one to carry. Naught and one to carry. Naught and one to carry. Naught and still there's one to carry. But where? Ah, there's the snag. Mathematicians call it the elusive one. But it presents no problem to the machine where it's merely brought back and added to the unit's wheel to give the answer as before. Now roll to counter six. The issues in counter one are next subtracted from the receipts in counter two. 225 less 89. So the complement of 89 is added. Plus the elusive one. Thus, in effect, counter two exceeds its maximum by 136 to give the actual stock. And here, the minimum stock permitted, 100 as it appears on the machine, where noughts are blanks on adding wheels. Minimum stock less actual stock will give the balance against the minimum, or free stock, 100 minus 136, which is minus 36, of course. But on the machine, the complement of 136 is still added to 100. And nine, and nine, and nine, and nine, and no elusive one, which gives this most unlikely figure it is, of course, the nines complement of 36, which appears here in the counter because the answer is a minus quantity. But on its way to the print bank, 
this complement in counter five is automatically converted to the true figure and correctly printed 36 with the designation DB for debit. And so for all six counters, adding, subtracting, rolling, printing. Throughout eight cycle functions of the machine to produce the finished statement on locking plates, like this. zero eyes and the machine continue. Now with cotter pins, then crown wheels for the differential, and so on through the stock items of the factory. We've seen here a most complex job in accountancy, but the information in these cards is by no means exhausted. By sorting on different controlling numbers, an infinite variety of facts and figures, both simple and elaborate, can be extracted from a single pack of cards. Such machines as these are being used today by concerns both large and small, in industry, in the distributive trades by government departments, municipal and local authorities, insurance companies, in His Majesty's forces, by nationalized undertaking, and in hospitals and laboratories for vital statistical and medical research. There's no job too big to be handled by these machines, few jobs too small. His only problem is what to do with the books. Punched cards now touch almost every aspect of our daily lives. Precision engineering has been applied to the age-old problem of counting, to the art of accountancy. Machines now increase the efficiency of administration. They are retooling the job in the office. Man has put the figures to work for themselves. But don't go out and burn those old books, for they too may provide valuable material for historical research in the future, as indeed will the punched cards of today already accumulating in the archives of the nations.